As many of us know from personal experience with family and friends, the devastating condition that's Alzheimer's disease is placing an unprecedented demand on our healthcare system, as well as on personal and family resources. Our guest today, Dr. Huntington Potter, is Professor of Neurology and Director of the Alzheimer's Disease uh, Programs on the Anschutz Medical Campus. Prior to joining UC Denver, uh, Dr. Potter studied, re uh, researched, and taught for 30 years at Harvard University. Uh, like his uh, junior namesake, Harry, uh, he's a bit of a science wizard uh, with a number of important discoveries in his field, including the fact that Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome are related. Maybe he'll tell us more about that. He is the author of over 100 scientific articles and books and holder of many patents, uh, including, I've heard, and this is not uh, generally known, a second generation invisibility cloak. <laughs> I invite you to listen to our, as our distinguished guest and science wizard shares news about some of the exciting discoveries he and his colleagues are making in the field of Alzheimer's research and, that prom and what that promises for the future. So please give a warm rotary welcome now to Dr. Huntington Potter. Well, thank you all for coming out and uh, spending a beautiful day inside instead of outdoors. Um, what I'm going to try to leave you with is where we are in our fight to understand and hopefully treat and eventually cure Alzheimer's disease worldwide and what we're specifically uh, doing here uh, in uh, Colorado at the uh, CU Anschutz uh, Medical Campus. Um, now, this first slide is just the, uh, you know, the title and my name, but it has a, a very special message, which is buried right here, and that is that this year, the legislature passed and Governor Hickenlooper uh, signed a new bill uh, that declared that our mandate was not just Alzheimer's disease, but it was all dementing diseases and related disabilities. And, and that's very big. We were already doing that. Many of you know that uh, dementia can come in various different forms. Alzheimer's just happens to be the most common way to get dementia when you're elderly. But you can have vascular dementia, you can have frontal temporal dementia, and all of these dementias lead to disabilities, and, and we should consider them as disabilities and, and treat people uh, accordingly. Uh, so we're very proud of that new mandate, and uh, we'll move forward with that in, in mind. Okay, so where did Alzheimer's disease begin? Uh, this woman, August Dieter, uh, was uh, looked at by this physician, Alois Alzheimer, uh, around 1907. And she had the absolutely classic clinical symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, namely uh, very, very poor short-term memory, uh, confusion about where she was, what time of year it was, and eventually she became rather paranoid, uh, didn't recognize her physicians or her family, and uh, thought that people were, were uh, conspiring against her, and eventually died. Uh, now, that by itself would not be remarkable, but at that time, there were some new techniques that allowed Dr. Alzheimer to examine the brain of August Dieter at autopsy, and what he saw were the lesions that we still define Alzheimer's disease by right now, namely the uh, senile plaques or amyloid uh, plaques and the uh, neurofibrillary tangles. And I'll tell you a little bit about what those uh, constitute as we go along. For decades and decades and decades after this, Alzheimer's disease was considered extremely rare, curious uh, uh, syndrome, and uh, not even uh, particularly uh, uh, you know, taught in medical school. And the reason for that was a definitional reason. Alzheimer's disease was considered a dementia of early onset, that is to say in the year 50s, or maybe earlier, and uh, was completely different than senile dementia, which was uh, recognized in people, say, over the age of 60 or 65, and was for many decades 
considered to be a normal aspect of aging that affected many people, but not all. And what we found out by looking at the pathology and the genetics and the biochemistry in the 60s and 70s was that these two disorders were really the same and they should be all called Alzheimer's disease. And the end result is that now Alzheimer's disease is an extremely common problem. If you look around the room, if everyone here lived to be 85, half of us would have Alzheimer's disease. And the other half would be a caregiver. And, and that's because we now recognize it as not a normal form of aging, but a disorder. And modern medicine has allowed uh, us all to live to be 85 much more commonly than before. So we're getting into the age where, where this is more common. So 40 to 50% of people over the age of 85, about 10% of people over 65, that translates to over 5 million people in the United States alone, obviously many, many times that worldwide. And the current cost in the US is about $220 billion a year direct. That doesn't even count the free care that uh, home caregivers uh, give. And that's gonna go up to about a trillion dollars a year for Medicare and Medicaid alone by 2050 if we don't solve this problem. So obviously we can't afford that and, and we're here to try to help uh, it ameliorate that problem. The way to do that is to have centers where research and care are carried out together. And you can see what's the problem with this, uh, with this map, which is that uh, most of the uh, Alzheimer's centers are on the east and the west coast, and there's this big gap between Kansas City and the west coast, which we at CU Anschutz are, are trying to fill. When I first came uh, six years ago with a mandate to start an Alzheimer's center, we had one part-time physician seeing about 100, 150 uh, patients a year. We now see over 3,000 patients a year. We have six faculty physicians, fellows, scientists, and uh, we offer a range of care, accurate diagnosis, latest treatments such as they are, and the opportunities to participate in research, which I'll tell you a little bit about today. So we're expanding and we welcome you to come and make an appointment for you or your loved one or your friend um, and, and be properly diagnosed. And that, that's really very, very important. Uh, community physicians are very dedicated, even when they're neurologists, uh, they may not know enough to really distinguish the different kinds of dementia and that could be important because uh, Jonathan Woodcock, who's the head of the Memory Disorders Clinic, often jokes that he's cured more people of Alzheimer's disease by taking them off drugs than putting them on drugs. And of course, the reason for that is we don't cure Alzheimer's disease with drugs, but it also is true that you can be taking the wrong kinds of medicines, which combined can give you memory problems, and, and only an expert can, can recognize that. So it is important to be properly diagnosed. But ultimately, because we don't have good treatments for Alzheimer's disease yet, we need more research. And the two pictures here uh, that I've chosen are very emblematic of our work. The first one is this individual has Down syndrome, as you can recognize, and as you'll hear, every single person with Down syndrome develops the pathology in the brain, the plaques and the tangles of Alzheimer's disease by the time they're 30 or 40 years old. And the majority are demented by the time they're 50 or 60. Now the reason we know that is that 30 years ago, the life expectancy for somebody with Down syndrome was about 20 because of poor care and lack of understanding. Now it's about 60 but they get Alzheimer's disease. The other slide is from our laboratory, and Gilbert Canoose, who just got his PhD and has moved back to Florida, and Tim Boyd, uh, who's still with us here at the Anschutz Medical Campus, play very important roles in their research I'm gonna tell you about. So what did Alzheimer actually see? Well, I mentioned the plaques and the tangles, and that's illustrated here. Here is a plaque with a core of amyloid, and uh, these uh, uh, occur by the millions in the parts of the brain involved in cognition and memory, and they damage the surrounding nerve cells, such as this one, which eventually develops this tangle, this protein deposit inside the nerve cell, which will eventually kill that nerve cell. So the end result is that the brain is much smaller in a person with Alzheimer's disease because a lot of nerve cells and a lot of nerve cell connections have died. Um, and the pathology is what defines the disease. So how does this tell us how we could develop treatments for Alzheimer's disease? The obvious question is, do we want to get rid of this, or is it just a correlate of the disease and isn't causal? 
Well, the answer to that came with studying when and how these deposits occur. Now, when I first started Alzheimer's disease research in about 1985, it was said that you could not diagnose Alzheimer's with surety until an autopsy, which is a little late. Uh, and, and that's how Alzheimer's uh, defined the disease. But the amyloid deposits which define Alzheimer's disease can in fact be seen in a living individual now, and that's shown here. Uh, this is a positron emission tomography, which is a special kind of brain scan. And, and what we do is we inject a little tiny bit of this radioactive compound, Pittsburgh compound B, because it was invented at the University of Pittsburgh, and it's designed to stick to the amyloid deposits. So here's what a normal person would look like at the age of 65 or 70. You can see there's a little bit of red, but mostly it's green and blue, and that means there's not much amyloid here. We all develop a little bit with age. But here's a person with Alzheimer's disease, you see it's all full of red uh, because they have amyloid. What this did was allow us to understand a very key fact, which is that Alzheimer's disease begins at least 20 years before the first clinical symptoms, and maybe even earlier. So that means it's not a disease of aging, it's a disease of middle age, it's just that we didn't know it. Uh, and the end result of those kinds of studies are shown here where non-demented individuals, non-demented individuals with preclinical AD are, are still have a lot of amyloid. In fact, the amyloid reaches a maximum before there's any clinical symptoms. And then the tangles become uh, evident later and the nerve cells die. So obviously early diagnosis is going to be at least as important as, as treatment because we probably are going to have to treat early. Uh, once the nerve cells are dead, it's very unlikely we're going to be developing uh, ways to bring them back again. So before I go on, I want to uh, illustrate that Alzheimer's disease is not just one kind of disorder. Pathologically and biochemically, it is identical, but uh, the early onset Alzheimer's disease that uh, uh, August Dieter has uh, are the genetic forms, where uh, less than 5%, really less than 2% of Alzheimer's disease uh, patients have this, and it's extremely rare, and it's caused by a mutation in the genes uh, of one of three genes uh, which cause familial Alzheimer's disease. So if your father or your mother has this kind of Alzheimer's disease, you're guaranteed to get it if you inherit the mutant gene, and you got a 50-50 chance of that. But that becomes very important for studying the disease, but it is really uh, rare. All of us are really at risk for the sporadic uh, late onset Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome I already mentioned. So how do we treat Alzheimer's disease in the clinic now? There are four drugs that are FDA approved. Uh, there won't really be a test about which ones they are. Some of you may recognize them. Um, but what they do is help the nerve cells that are left just talk to each other a little bit better. So here's the talking nerve cell, here's the hearing nerve cell, and there's a gap in between them. And the way they talk to each other is that this nerve cell releases a chemical, which we call a neurotransmitter, because it transmits from here to there, and uh, it gets detected by this nerve cell. And so it goes on, and then it gets degraded, it goes off, and it comes on, it gets off, and that's how you think. Um, and what these uh, uh, drugs do is they just help this nerve cell communicate a little bit better. Well that doesn't attack the disease, it just is sort of a crutch or a band-aid on the problem. And indeed, these drugs slow the course of the disease, they do not reverse it, and they don't slow it very much. Uh, but they're all we got right now. And in order to develop more, we have to understand more about what the disease does. And the first breakthrough came in 1984 when George Glenner and Kenny Wong uh, found out biochemically what the major component of this amyloid deposit was. And that's what we call the A-beta peptide down here. It's about 40 amino acids long. Uh, again, there won't be a test, D-A-E-F-R. Uh, I don't even know what it is. Um, but uh, these amino acids uh, combine to make these amyloid deposits, and they eventually kill nerve cells. But the really important thing about this discovery was it opened up all of the genetics and biochemistry of Alzheimer's disease. And the reason is that that amyloid peptide is really the cause of the problem. And we know that for two very important reasons. 
The first is that the gene that encodes that peptide is called the amyloid precursor protein gene, and it's on chromosome 21. And for those of you who know, people with Down syndrome all have three copies of chromosome 21 instead of two copies, like all the rest of us have. So that means they got three copies of this gene, and they more, more amyloid that begins in their teenage years and accumulates uh, until they're 30 or 40, where they look like full-blown Alzheimer's. So that's a first hint. The second was that, remember those families that get inherited Alzheimer's disease? Here's one of those families. Uh, here's a typical person with Alzheimer's disease. Half their children have Alzheimer's disease. That's a mutation in the APP gene that is inherited through that family. So that means that if you overexpress the protein or you have a mutation in the protein, you get an Alzheimer's disease. That means this is important and we should study what it does. The third thing that's important about this discovery was it allowed us to solve a major problem, which is that we need an animal model for any disorder in order to be able to understand it and develop treatments. And the only animals that normally get Alzheimer's disease are monkeys, which are expensive and rather unethical to use in large numbers, and polar bears. And I guarantee you that my dean does not want a lot of polar bears running around the medical school. Uh, so we were in desperate straits, and uh, mice and, and rats, what we usually use, uh, don't get Alzheimer's disease naturally. But if you take the mutant gene out of some blood cells of a family member with inherited Alzheimer's disease, and you put it into a mouse, so the mouse is now partially human, as one mutant human gene, that mouse makes amyloid deposits in the brain. And that means we can also test whether that mouse has cognitive deficits or not. And, and that's shown here where there's a water maze, uh, which is just a kid's swimming pool with some channels in it. And uh, there's a little glass platform underneath the surface of the water at the end of one of these channels. And if the mouse ever is on that platform, either they found it by accident or you put them on it, they can look around the room and they can tell where the door is or where the picture of Mickey Mouse is, where the investigator is, who always stands in the same place. And every time you put that mouse anywhere in the pool, they immediately swim to the platform. And that means they have a memory of their three-dimensional structure, unless they have that mutant human gene and they have amyloid in the brain, and then they can't find the platform. So we have an animal model and we have a method of testing drugs to see whether the animal gets better or not. Now, for those of you who love mice, I want to guarantee that we absolutely do not mistreat these mice. They're extremely important collaborators. They're very expensive to maintain. This guy here costs more on a gram for gram basis to live in our mouse hotel for a year than it costs to pay a full professor salary. <laughs> well, you know, the professors are big and fat and the mice are you know, small, but nonetheless, we still need thousands of them and, and they're expensive and, and we take very good care of them. So what have they told us in our understanding of Alzheimer's disease, our search for understanding? Um, they've told us this slide. And uh, what it means is that the amyloid precursor protein chromosome 21 is expressed in many cells in the body. It's very important protein. And this little A-beta peptide, which makes the amyloid, is cut out by these two enzymes and begins to form fibers. And these fibers eventually kill cells in the brain. So this is our simplest sort of pathogenic pathway to Alzheimer's disease. It occurs in the mice, it occurs in people, whether they have Down syndrome or not. And um, you can sit here and you can say to yourself, well, heavens, I know how to cure Alzheimer's disease. All we have to do is get rid of this gene. If that's done in the mice, they don't get Alzheimer's disease, but they have other problems. It's an important gene. Well, what about inhibiting this enzyme or this enzyme with a drug so that the A-beta peptide never gets formed? Great idea, works great in the mice, it causes side effects in humans. So Lilly has developed a gamma secretase inhibitor, it failed. Too many side effects, not enough uh, reduction. Merck has just stopped a beta secretase trial because it didn't work very well. So, Good ideas don't necessarily work, and that's why we have so much effort more to do to, to solve Alzheimer's disease. 
The ones that look like they've got some promise are uh, the uh, drugs by Biogen and by Esai, one of them called Aducanumab, we're testing here at the Anschutz Medical Campus uh, in collaboration with centers around the uh, world. And what that is is an antibody which attacks the A-beta peptide both in its soluble and insoluble amyloid form and, and gets rid of it. Uh, it looks like it might help. People still decline. They just get worse more slowly. And some of the amyloid uh, gets removed. So that's, that's hopeful. Uh, it's still in clinical trials. Can't promise it's going to uh, come out of them in a positive way. But there are some side effects uh, as well. Bleeding into the brain, swelling of the brain, uh, not good things, uh, but they can deal with that. I've been talking about genetics. I've been talking about the A-beta peptide. But if you study the genetics, you discover that Alzheimer's disease is only about 60 or 70 percent genetic or inherited. We know something about the genes, uh, but it's also partially environmental and lifestyle. I'll give you an example of that. If you uh, put a mouse in a typical mouse cage here, they get food, they get water, they get Obamacare, and quite literally they're treated better than most humans on this planet. But it's a little boring. And if we put them in the club med cage over here, they have other mice to play with, they have running wheels for exercise, they got toys that change every week, little mazes, and the same mice then don't get Alzheimer's disease clinical symptoms. That's interesting, and there's evidence in humans that that also is true. So the take home for that is exercise, 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 and come to Rotary so you have other people to talk to and you can get uh, meta, uh, you know, uh, mentally stimulated. Um, so we're trying to study what that does, uh, and, and that's exciting. Here are the risk factors uh, that increase or decrease our risk for Alzheimer's disease in the environment. Increased risk, high blood pressure, stroke, high cholesterol. Obviously, you want to get rid of those anyway for your heart, and the Alzheimer's Association often says what's good for your heart is good for your brain. Take it to heart and brain and, uh, and, and try to address these problems. Smoking increases your risk about two-fold. Type 2 diabetes about two, two-and-a-half-fold. Low educational attainment's not good. It may be an indicator instead of a cause. High BMI in midlife, that's not good. But there are some things that you can use to decrease risk like we did in the animals. Exercise, exercise, exercise. That has been shown to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease. We and others have found that caffeine reduces the risk as well. Uh, in mice, it completely reverses the cognitive deficit, so it's right back there. Uh, go ahead, drink up. And uh, cognitive activity, uh, such as uh, uh, rotary, for instance. Down syndrome. Yes, everyone with Down syndrome develops Alzheimer's disease pathology. Almost all of them develop dementia. But I was in a meeting just about this size in the New Hampshire woods and came up with a crazy idea. Maybe people with typical Alzheimer's disease actually develop Down syndrome-like cells over the course of their life. They accumulate in the brain and uh, they help cause their Alzheimer's disease. Um, so I sent a paper off to a journal uh, suggesting this idea, and I got a four-line rejection. The last line was, I wouldn't recommend publishing this manuscript anywhere at any time. <laughs> Scientists have to have tough skins. But it did get published, and uh, we've spent some time over the last 20 years showing that it's true. So how do you count chromosomes? Well, the first thing you can do is you can spread them out and stain them and count them like this. One, two, three, that person has three copies of chromosome 21, happens to be a person with Down syndrome. This cell has only two copies of chromosome 21. We can label it with this fluorescent dye. And when we looked in the skin cells of people with Alzheimer's disease, both familial, inherited, and sporadic, we found that about 5% of the skin cells have three copies of chromosome 21. That's amazing. They're partially Down syndrome. And that's true in the brain, too. Here's a uh, study in, uh, uh, by Yorof, and almost 10% of the nerve cells in a brain of a person with Alzheimer's disease have three copies of chromosome 21 instead of two, and they're pumping out that A-beta peptide. Furthermore, some of their brain cells have the wrong number of other chromosomes, and these cells tend to die. 
So this is a characteristic feature of Alzheimer's disease and of many other dementias, and we're now understanding how it happens, why it happens, and trying to develop drugs to prevent it from happening. Uh, so that's one of the things that we've uh, discovered here at, at CU Edgeships. Now, it's all fine to study people with Down syndrome. They get Alzheimer's disease. I'm part of the Linda Cernick Institute for Down syndrome. But uh, they give us insights. But what about people who almost never get Alzheimer's disease? Wouldn't that be great? And it turns out that people with rheumatoid arthritis oops, um, almost never get Alzheimer's disease. And uh, it was thought that it was the drugs that they take. Um, but we had a different idea because when these drugs were tested, uh, it, it didn't work in people with Alzheimer's disease. Um, so to make a long story short, Gilbert Canoe studied the aneuploidy, the wrong number of chromosomes in that first slide. Tim Boyd and I discovered this protein, GMCSF, uh, which we think explains why people with rheumatoid arthritis don't get Alzheimer's. And, and we did the first experiment with this mouse. We injected GMCSF. Uh, into this side of the brain, artificial salt water and, uh, into this side of the brain. And look, a lot of the amyloid is gone. We can quantitate that over that. That's one injection. One week later, half the amyloid was gone. If you inject it under the skin so it goes everywhere, the mice become perfectly normal in that water maze in a couple of weeks of treatment. And the most exciting thing is this GMCSF protein uh, granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor. It, it stimulates the bone marrow to make a lot of granulocytes and macrophages. And these are like little Pac-Men that go around the body and eat up things that don't, aren't supposed to be there. And you can see that it gets rid of the amyloid. It's also a human drug already. FDA approved for the last 20 years to stimulate the bone marrow. So that means we could try a clinical trial, which we're in the midst of right now. Um, here are several of the kinds of clinical studies that we do at the Anschutz Medical Campus. And I'll tell you about this one, the study of leukine, which is the commercial name for, for um, GMCSF. And the data are looking very promising, which is that if you treat people with leukine for three weeks, they actually get better. And if you treat them with salt water or placebo, they don't. And then if you stop the drug, these people slowly decline back to where they started. This is very exciting. Nothing else has actually improved cognition, but we have a lot more work to do. This is only a three-week trial. We need to spend about $4 million on a longer trial, which we're in the midst of doing uh, right now. And uh, we're, we're hopeful, but only cautiously hopeful. Um, a lot of people are involved in this. A lot of people are involved in raising money for it. We're very appreciative of Bruce and Marcy Benson, the president and first lady of the university who helped start this, the Alzheimer's Association. I could go on. A lot of donors uh, we've been very grateful to all over the, uh, the Colorado region. And I don't want to be too you know, chauvinistic about my university, but uh, we do think the University of Colorado will contribute to uh, the understanding and the eventual cure for, for Alzheimer's disease. So I've gone over my time. I'm sorry. I will uh, entertain questions, and I'll hang out afterwards if you want to ask more than are allotted. Thanks very much. Sir. Okay, so the question is, should everyone in their 30s and 40s get an MRI to see if they might be a risk for Alzheimer's? Right. Okay, two aspects of that question. There's nothing we can do to stop the disease if we knew that you were going to get it at 30 or 40. And most importantly, an MRI is not going to do it. Even an MRI in somebody who is 70 doesn't tell you whether they have Alzheimer's disease. They only tell you whether the brain has shrunken a little bit. And that could be due to a lot of problems. So anyone who tells you you should go and have your brain scanned with an MRI for X thousand dollars is, is misleading you. Yes, sir. With regards to the cognitive activity being one of the things that will help, um, has any research been done regarding computer use, computer games, 
Okay, so the question is, is uh, Sudoku or anything like that going to reduce your risk for Alzheimer's disease? Unfortunately, I have to be agnostic about that. The data just aren't there in people with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I will say that if you take people with Alzheimer's disease and you teach them a very specific skill, such as making change for a, for a purchase, um, they can learn that um, if you're very energetic about it. But it doesn't translate into a general improvement in cognition. So um, it's a great waste of time. I do it, uh, you know, to pass the time in between problems. But uh, it's not going to cure Alzheimer's. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> Yes, very good question. Um, it has been shown that the lack of sleep can increase your risk for Alzheimer's disease. And it's also been shown that during sleep, the amyloid peptide seems to be cleared out of the brain through a special uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, a sewer system called the glymphatic system. And uh, so that's very interesting, and we're now studying ways to try to improve that system so that maybe we don't have to sleep all the time to get rid of the amyloid. Um, but uh, it's early days about that. It's a very interesting question. Yes, in the back there. How about continually developing and stressing music locally and with instruments? Is that going to be helpful? Okay, so the question is, is music a potential therapy? There are some indications that music can uh, increase the, uh, the, the, the life, uh, you know, shall I say, happiness of people with Alzheimer's disease, especially music that comes from their period. It awakens memories, hopefully good ones, and, uh, and I think that's a, a good therapy, but there's no indication whatsoever that it actually attacks the disease itself. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the question is, what other kinds of lifestyle choices can you make to try to improve the, uh, uh, the, the possibility of avoiding Alzheimer's disease? Uh, the data are not clean on that yet, but it's true that if you lower your cholesterol and, and lower your BMI, um, this seems to reduce the risk. It may be because it reduces the risk of vascular dementia, which often occurs at the same time in the same place in Alzheimer's disease, um, the Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet. Um, on your tables, there's a handout, which is the six pillars of uh, brain health, uh, which give you a sense of what you might be able to do right now. And, and diet does enter into it, but it's not a a, a, a you know, magic bullet by any means. Um, but there are things that have been tested. So ginkgo biloba, for instance, is a classic Chinese drug. It's been known for thousands of years, and it uh, has been reputed to improve memory. Um, so the National Institutes of Health spent a half a billion dollars testing ginkgo biloba as a supplement, and it completely failed. Um, so we can't spend that amount of money on everything from broccoli to pistachio nuts to see if it improves uh, memory. But that was a, a, a good possibility and it didn't work. So the answer basically is we don't have any good evidence um, about that, except that eating healthy for, for your heart is probably going to help your brain. Dr. Potter, we certainly appreciate uh, your, uh, your discussion on this topic that's of vital importance to all of us. Uh, unfortunately, in Rotary, we get the last word, and we get to, uh, to, uh, to, yeah, right, to, to stop this discussion. But we want to thank you for presenting the historical background of Alzheimer's disease, for describing so carefully the incredible impact. It's not a, an impact on countries. It's an impact on people. And you've described very carefully how, uh, how it's impacted people uh, around the United States and around the rest of the world. Most importantly, you've given us a view toward future approaches that may help to mitigate uh, those, those terrible impacts. Now, in Rotary, and our governor has already discussed it, about 30-odd years ago, we began working on another terrible neurodegenerative disease. Uh, we began uh, uh, to eradicate polio. And as many of you know, the room, you know, we're like th this close. Uh, as, and so we've been doing this uh, for ages, and it really is conceivable that polio will be eradicated in the next few years. In your honor, the Boulder Rotary Club is pleased to contribute 100 doses of polio vaccine. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks. 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 Thanks.